called to order. And we're going to begin with some, some introductions. We have a couple of new members here. Yeah. So why don't we start over here with Steve. Steve Adams. I'm the new city engineer. Been here for almost three months now. Peter Pastorelli, Public Works Director. Lisa Beatty, City Council Member of the Budget Committee. John Stahl, Budget Committee Chair, Citizen Member. Uh, Kathy Icy, City Council. Uh, I'm Kaylee Nance, and I'm a Budget Committee Citizen Member. Angel Falconer, City Council. Keith McClung, Assistant Finance Director, July 1st, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bonnie Dennis, Finance Director. And Over City Manager. Leslie Schachner, I'm a Citizen Member of the Budget Committee. And a returning member. A returning member, after a long break. <laughs> Back for some more punishment. Now, we appreciate volunteers here. All right, approval of the May 20th, 2019 committee meeting minutes. I move to approve the budget committee minutes as written. I'll second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes. Any discussion? City manager update. Thank you, John. There's a lot going on in the city. We want to know about it. There's a lot going on in the city. Um, and so I'm going to go over very briefly a few items that are coming up over the next six months. But feel free to ask any questions tonight, and I'll try and address them as, as possible. Uh, so by December of this year, so December of 2019, we will have completed a number of projects that the council budgeted for in the last biennium. Uh, Kronberg Park is currently under construction. We're expecting that that'll be completed near the end of the year if not early in January. Uh, the downtown area has uh, already had a few successes, so we've been able to lower the train bridge, uh, change the turnaround point for the post office, and worked with Axletree in order to do a lot of the PARs, the frontage improvements on both sides of the street. What we're waiting on right now is we have, as we call it, the big pipe that has to go into Washington Street, but we've had some issues with a utility obstructing the way. They're coming in to start that work next week and we're hope two weeks this tonight week. nice tonight, tonight according to the in one hour we and got. 25 minutes yeah uh, <laughs> big pipe what is it do you want to answer storm pipe it's a 30 30 inch storm pipe i'm sorry storm water yeah, yeah it's a 30 inch storm water pipe we're putting in up to the railroad tracks right now it stops just short of 21st because of a concrete in case utility bank that is dead in its way yeah uh, and that was a, a problem with one of the utilities. We had encouraged them to come in 120 days prior to us starting construction, and they came in at 119 days and found a large obstruction. Uh, so we've been working with them to try and get that moving as quickly as possible. Uh, we also, so Axletree is scheduled to be opening in the near future. They're under construction right now and it's looking great. That's not our project, but it definitely impacts the surrounding projects. Uh, outside of the downtown core, in that area at least, we have two safe projects that have been completed. We're going to be doing a little ribbon cutting, I think, for those in a week or two. Um, so council will be hearing about those and if any budget committee members are interested in coming out and celebrating with us, we're, we're very excited to which, see which the first of those. those? Selwood and Ardenwald, mm -hmm. yes. is that correct? Yes. Ardenwald, I'll be there. Perfect. <laughs> um, next year we have five scheduled, so you'll see a lot of projects coming up next year as well. Uh, the library is on schedule, so that's expected to be finishing up at the end of the year and with a move-in date opening, we're hoping in January. Um, we have the comprehensive plan coming to a close. We're expecting to adopt that document at the end of December or by the end of December with January really starting the uh, code rewrites that are associated with that process and starting the conversations with the community about the details associated with the comprehensive plan decisions. That process is going to take several years. This is not going to be fast, so we'll be working with council to prioritize the items within the comprehensive plan to make sure that we're addressing the code fix that are most important to council first and then moving through the rest of them over the course of those couple so, years. Unlike the city of Portland, their neighborhood associations, we're actually gonna talk to people before we just go do it. We do. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've been talking to them a lot. Oh, for two years. <laughs> uh, and I, I do wanna 
take a moment to thank our comprehensive plan committee. They have put in countless hours. Councilor Beatty sits on that as does the mayor and it has been a real lift, a lot of detailed rewriting of rewording of small decisions that end up being huge impacts to our community. So I really appreciate the time and effort the community members have put into that. Um, trying to think, I think those are the big items to announce. TSP. TSP mm -hmm. will be a part of that prioritization. So council will be looking at us after the comprehensive plan is complete to talk about where that falls in the prioritization with other items. It's all the same staff who will be working with our city engineer to make sure that that document is updated uh, with the correct zoning in place so that we can actually do the calculations needed for the TSP. Could you explain what a TSP is? Transportation. System plan. System plan. plan. <laughs> Thank you. It's the outline of what we need to do to our street network to make it function with the population increases and changes? I actually just realized I had two projects I forgot to talk about. One is that we did put down 6.1 miles of slurry seal this year. It was a oh big yeah. lift for our Seen team. That around town. It turned out great. So uh, both thank you to the staff, but also to the company who helped deliver that project. And who was that, Peter? Uh, that was Blackline. Uh, they did an exceptional job. It was a, it was actually fun for me to go out and watch them do the, the laying down of the slurry seal. They would do one city block in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, it was shockingly fast. Did you get to use the roller? Um, I was not allowed to use a roller this summer, but I was allowed to fill a pothole with our new pothole filling machine, and I was super excited about it. Um, and that's your resume. I, I did. Um, we also are in the process of doing well number two, which was a large uh, infrastructure improvement project out of our CIP. So Peter's going to talk a little bit about that tonight, but both of those are also on schedule. So thank you to the public works team. You don't want to talk about the library at all, or it's just going oh, I did. very smooth? And the library is going great. Uh, we're expecting the siding to go up here in the next <laughs> week. Uh, so it's, it's really coming through to fruition. Um, yeah, it's it's a beautiful building. I'm excited for it to open. How how much bigger is the new library than the old one? So the new library is 18,000 square feet. The old library was 12. Uh, so this is a substantially larger space. The, the biggest part of this is that it's all on one floor. Uh, we had some concerns with the way that the structure was actually managed when it was uh, added onto when the amendments were placed into the building. Um, so. We were worried it would fall inward, and the kids were all downstairs. Uh, so we were, we were trying to get them up onto the main floor with the rest of us. So uh, I appreciate. I know a lot of parents appreciate that. Well, plus not having a stairway and a elevator, elevator bank Absolutely. buys a thousand or more square feet. You know, yeah. of usable space. The elevator space. was just a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? Yep. Yeah. And then we also got a community room out of it. So it has a 75-person uh, community room. It also has a Friends of the Letting Library space so that they can sell books. And those dollars all come back into the library as a reinvestment, which is very cool. They won't be selling out of the pond house anymore? They won't. They have actually moved all of their books out. Um, they will be moving them into this space. They have a very nice room, just as you're walking into the building off to the right, uh, where they will have a full-time display. And what will happen to the pond house? Uh, the pond house is scheduled to be sold, but we are bringing that to council in September for that discussion to assure that we're meeting the expectations of council. Thank you. Absolutely. We have talked in the past at this meeting about the city hall. That uh, building is still up for discussion and under negotiation, so the city's not talking about it a lot tonight, but we're hoping to have more information in the next week. When I added this agenda item, that's just kind of the rapid fire kind of thing I was looking for, so let's move on to uh, Perfect. the budget supplemental discussion item five. Okay, so, um, Good evening. Uh, we have two budget, well, there's one budget supplemental and one transfer. The first budget transfer is the right of way. Um, we had a right of way contracts coordinator position that was previously moved into the city manager's budget. Um, recently, that person has departed with the city, so we are now realigning um, the the position and um, and the funds associated with that. So we are moving the funds that were recently moved over to city manager's department into the finance department. We are uh, 
uh, now reallocating uh, a half-time employee and then also uh, doing a request for proposal that's out right now. So um, with that, that's a total transfer of uh, 124,000. Um, there's about 32,000 that's going to personal services and then 92,000 going into materials and services into the finance department. So why is materials and services so big for that job? Because we had originally had a full-time employee. Mm -hmm. um, now that's being shifted to a half-time. Oh, so that's time. the contract. So, that's yeah. the money to pay to contract out some of that. I see. And the okay. half-time employee is doing just the administrative portions of the, like accepting all the payments and just tracking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more of a finance right function at that point. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. We're managing a contract at that right. point. Yeah. Exactly. And the work that the contractor actually does is compared to administrative functions, what is that? So um, it's going and looking for uh, companies, telecommunication companies that are um, using our right of way lines without. And, and not paying. And not paying. Yeah. So that's the big bulk of the contract. Eliminate the free for. riders. Is that related in any way to the franchise fees being so, revenues being so low? In the in the quarterly report, um, well, that is actually a little bit of a timing. Um, we're in the fourth quarter, and I'll go, I was going to go into oh, a little okay. bit more detail okay. on that. Yeah. So, but um, but they are connected. That's the franchise fees. Yeah. And that person, I mean, we also have some code we have to work on, right? Yes. So that person will help with that, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Definitely. When this was uh, a staff person, they were doing a significant amount of state and federal work. Uh, and Kelly Brooks, our assistant city manager, does most of the government relations work. That's why we moved it under her, was to make sure that there was sort of a, a system to how we were managing our relationships outward into the other um, government agencies. That's a much smaller component of the job at this point. Okay. Uh, the second one that we have is actually in the building fund. So we have seen um, great um, revenues coming in in the building fund, but with that comes the additional workload on staff um, and putting more into contractual services, which they will do the inspections, um, whereas Sam, she, she doesn't have the ability and the time to do. So um, I spoke with Sam Vandergrip, our building um, official, and she agrees that moving $100,000 out of revenue into to contractual services for the coming fiscal year uh, makes sense. Um, we're definitely still seeing that increase of time, not as much as in FY in fiscal year 19, but we are still um, needing to have that resource available. So I'm proposing that we move $100,000 out of using out of revenue into contractual services. That does require a public hearing, so that will be um, on the city council agenda in a couple weeks, um, but it's it's a it's a good problem to have um, that we've had definitely a pretty strong year for the building inspections fund. So, so anytime you increase the budget, you have to have a hearing outside of what you approved before. Even though you're making like eight hundred thousand now, I'm going to mm -hmm. put a hundred thousand. You still have to have a hearing. Only if it affects ten percent of the fund. So, for example, the, the yeah, the yeah. right of way doesn't impact the general fund. Um, I think it's like five percent, right, right, right. not even that probably. Um, but then building, in building that hundred thousand, kicked it over the ten percent rule. Right. Okay. Yeah. And as I recall, she was having trouble finding outside contractor or inspectors for a while. If we that's not a problem anymore, we have enough. It doesn't seem contract to be a problem. Inspectors, okay. We've had people out on job sites most weeks uh, when she's unable to fulfill it, so I believe she's had them going out namely on Fridays. Yeah. Uh, but that relationship seems to be working, and we've been hearing positives from the developers in town about yeah. how, inspector. She's, how, how that Our was Our customer working. service. Mm. Yeah. yeah, with her. Good. So did um, we do anything, or this was just advisory, or? I, think we have I have a question. question. So just for my own clarity, the balance that doesn't get appropriated goes to the ending balance, is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If um, it go if 
Are you talking about the expenditure side? No. So well, I'm talking about the, uh, the, the surplus revenue. The surplus, surplus revenue. revenue. Yes. Right. Yeah, it was going to ending fund balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's just advisory, so there's no need for a vote. Yeah. On to item six, then, unless there's any other questions. I did just. I realized I didn't do this at the start of the meeting. Both um, Councillor Parks and the Mayor are both excused uh, from tonight's meeting, so they apologize they couldn't make it. Okay. okay. Another quarterly report. Go for it. Okay. So um, I am uh, gonna start with the good news. Um, we received our CAFR award for um, from the Government Finance Officers Association. We both, it was a, the CAFR and the PAFR. So the CAFR is the annual financial report. And then we also have the popular annual financial report, which is um, a much more condensed version of the CAFR. So, um, so congratulations to Judy and the rest of the finance team for making that happen last year, so. Yeah. Great. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and now we have Keith here, who's actually going to be working on the audit for fiscal year 2019, and we're already in full swing on that. So, yeah. Um, and then moving on, so I'm going to start with the general fund, unless anybody's got any questions on. Did you get a new auditor? Or? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, Marina, 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 Marina. Marina, okay. Marina and company is our new auditors. So, and they've been great to work with. We're really, really happy with them. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the general fund. Um, I did make a couple of general improvements in the document overall, um, but most of those improvements are actually later in the enterprise funds, and we'll be talking more with Steve and Peter on those as well. But in the general fund, um, property taxes and franchise fees, they're kind of in, a, in arrears right now because we're in the fourth quarter. So we're, as we're going through the audit, the fourth quarter, financials will change. Um, this happens every year. We're working through our accruals. Um, we're working through all of our adjustments. Uh, the the difference is, is that we've had, this, this meeting's actually a little bit earlier this year, um, and so we don't have all of the accruals in there, so actually some of these numbers will change. So property taxes can go up or up, um, or the franchise fees also can, can can change as we get more of those revenues coming in. Uh, the last meeting I explained a little bit about that 60 day rule, um, that plays into that here. So at the next quarterly meeting, I will have more final numbers for you. But, but these are pretty strong numbers as well, so I don't wanna um, dissuade you from that. Um, but uh, overall, the um, uh, property uh, property taxes and franchise fees, they, uh, they'll be coming in a little bit differently next quarter. Um, investment earnings are high. Um, we, were st we kept at the 2.75% in this last quarter. We just got notification from LGIP that that is actually going from 2.75 to 2.6. So we're gonna see a little bit of a decrease in the next quarter. So that, that's effective in August. I think August 7th is when it became effective. Um, outside of that, most of this information is very similar to the previous quarters. Um, engineering services has vacancies, uh, which is uh, giving them quite the savings. Uh, facilities management has, and the PIG fund also has, uh, um, funds are on hold for the renovation of the city hall. So um, until we know what we're doing with that, we're just holding off on any of the city hall projects. Could you explain what PEG means? Oh, sorry, uh, public education and government um, access. It's, uh, we get funds from Comcast um, and they, uh, 
uh, a certain percentage, I think it's 3%. Mm -hmm. So it's a percentage that comes in from Comcast and we use that only for specifically for uh, items related to public education systems. So for example, the TV and um, everything that's being broadcast out, those are the only funds that could be used specifically for public access. So, Thank you. Yeah. I have, I have a question, it, and it's, it's sort of going back, but in terms of looking at the franchise fees, and I understand you say that, there, you know, there's uh, amounts that, the amounts are going to change because you are, you know, adding back the accruals or whatever. Sure. Do you have any sense that it will in fact be close to the budget or will it be under the budget still when that happens? Uh, I would suspect that it's probably going to be, still be under budget and that might be because um, the, we didn't get all of our payments in like as we expected or it might have been we expected more to be budgeted for. So I'm, I'm expecting it to be less than budgeted but not much more than that. But not much uh, in terms of not much more in terms of percentage under. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, okay. And in, in terms of franchise fees, is that I would assume that some of that is fairly routine from year to year. Mm -hmm. What would be changing that it would be under or over? Uh, we get new providers, um, or we get uh, providers that have left the city. Like who? Who would? I mean, well, we have a lot of example. Yeah, we have a lot of telecommunication providers, um, and they range all across the board. So, um, uh, we have a lot of. Um, I, we have a number of providers. There so, are some that are just, yeah. they're not public, they're not residential like you and me, they're yeah. just business, ser they're serving businesses and stuff. There's like a bunch of these little, yeah. little telecom providers that, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and they fluctuate. I mean, some uh, and they all string all the wire. Is that why we have a franchise fee for it? Or they utilize existing wire? Oh, okay. Uh, so it may be that they're piggybacking on another. But line. they still have to pay because they're a different Correct. company. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. We also have had a few situations where uh, either the council's goal, the council's ordinances have changed, and they have changed how much we collect from an organization, or where the federal law has changed, or the state law for that matter. So we're we're in a lot of flux all the time. There was a ruling last week, again, on um, one of our providers. So it's it's not stagnant. It's something that we are watching all the time. It's why we feel like we need to bring in a contractor to help us through that process. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a crapshoot. Do we still have, uh, does every, is, are all the, are all the people who are supposed to be paying us franchise fees in agreement with the amount they're supposed to be paying? Or we still have some that are balking at the amount they're supposed to be paying? We still have some that are balking at the amount uh, and we have decided not to challenge that until we have somebody on board mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't accidentally misstep during that process and, mm -hmm. and create something that we're unable to collect from. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions on the general fund? Okay. Uh, um, well, just up in the revenue, licenses and permits. So that's business licenses and what other things go in that category? Yeah, so that would be business licenses, um, alarm permits. Oh. Um, parking permits? Parking permits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The accruals you guys are working on, is that just related to your revenue or because it looks like all of your expenditures are? Yeah, yeah, it's all related to revenue. Oh, okay, so those are. Yeah, so the expenditures are, yeah. I mean, we might have some expenses that are still being reviewed and looked at, um, but the expenses are pretty much. Those numbers are much firmer. Than firmer, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay, on uh, debt service fund, um, there's not much to really say on debt service. It's uh, revenues are coming in and debt's going, debt service payments are going out. Um, the building fund on page 10. Uh, 
this will, this is where you're gonna see where the, the revenue has um, surpassed the budget for the fiscal year. Um, and then also you see how much over we are currently at materials and services. We are still within budget law, however, because um, we're not, um, we're not over in the two year period, um, but this is why we're doing the supplemental coming up. Um, any questions on the building before I move on to library? Okay. Can I just, so what you're saying is, as long as it's within the biennial total, it's okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can, as long as, so the, the nice thing about the two year budget is that if you don't spend all your money, um, all the appropriated, you have you have two years to spend that appropriated money. Um, but if you are going over budget, and obviously in the building fund, the materials and services line item, we're going over budget, you can see that and make adjustments as you go along in order to make sure you don't go over budget. So, but yes, you do have like a two year period to. And and is and what is the percentage that you can go over without having to make a change? You can't. You can't, okay. Yeah, I mean, technically you, you can, but you get written up by the auditors. <laughs> yeah, we, okay. we don't like that, so. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so. Okay, the library fund. <laughs> um, library funds, uh, fines are less than anticipated. Um, we're hoping to see that increase as we move into the new building. I owe some. <laughs> yeah. Not that much, two. but I owe some. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, again, investment earnings, most of that is related to the um, LGIP being increased uh, at 2.75%. So we've gotten some investment there. And then materials and services um, costs are, they include the uh, temporary building. I think that was a question that came up before. So the temp temporary building costs are located in materials and services. Capital outlay is strictly just for the um, construction of the new library. And currently we're on, on track. So, okay. The flexible budget shows that our fund balance would have been 2.3 million in the hole. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I mean, how does that work? That, I mean, can't, you can't really go below zero, can you? No, um, it's basically because we're spending a lot more in this this current year than because of the construction of the library. Right, right. Um, than the actual revenue coming in. The it's a little misleading because we do have the debt that we've taken on for the right, library. Right. So, I. It's kind of an artifact. Yeah, to it, it is. Up yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay, transportation fund. Um, okay, so one more question. Yeah. The local government investment pool. Yes. What is that? So. Uh, uh, in the state of Oregon, um, a whole bunch of different cities and uh, local jurisdictions can invest their funds into this local government investment pool, which is ran by the state. So school districts um, um, and cities it's like, in the state. It's like the state's bank, and then they can use that money yeah. for other good things. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so it all gets pulled in. We're, we're set at a cap, though. Um, I think it's... 40, 49 million, so we can only, we can't put more than $49 million of our money into, the city's money into LGIP. Um, but because we, of state law or because of city? Because state law. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but that, but, but it's, it's a nice, way to get more interest because all the pooled money is coming in and so that's why we get a pretty good interest rate on it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, transportation fund. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Steve um, and then also Peter's going to talk about the uh, water, wastewater and stormwater funds. But the one thing I wanted to point out here is I did include a total obligation, total funds obligated. So you'll see in the capital outlay line item, uh, this is on page 13, 
Uh, currently it shows that we are at 45% um, of capital outlay expenses. However, we do have, and you'll see it on the next page, uh, I couldn't fit it on one page, uh, you'll see that we actually have 3.7 million, almost 3.8 million are obligated. We have contracts already out there um, and we have more coming. So I wanna turn it over to Steve to talk a little bit more about projects or if you have any other questions. Can you, you know, give John's us a little uh, primer on uh, expended funds versus obligated funds for those who may not oh, sure. be talking about? Sure, sorry. Uh, expended funds is what we've actually spent to date. So it's invoice and money and checks we have submitted to the contractors. Obligated funds are actual contracts that we have in place um, and we are spending um, city funds towards that contract. So for example, uh, the SSMP South Downtown Improvements, we have an actual contract for that um, and we have what's remaining on that contract, $394,000. So you haven't spent the money, but you're obligated. Right. You're going to spend the money. And we expect it. Soon enough. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly. And I would just add that we are not able to take out a contract without having the funds budgeted and planned for. So part of why it's important for us to have this cash in hand is that we can't uh, sign a contract until we know we actually have the cash to meet the contract demands. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll add that the obligated funds will increase by about $1 million next Tuesday when council hopefully approves the SSMP project for 2019. So that's on your council agenda for next week. So that's a rebuilding of three streets here in the city. Could you spell out what SSMP means? I'm going to be a stickler about street. this because we have new members. Okay. <laughs> that's good. I get it right here. Street Surface Maintenance Program. So it's basically, it's what we do to maintain or rebuild the city streets around here. So the slurry streets we've seen are part of the SSM. Yes, they are. And this new contract is for completely rebuilding three streets. And you'll see a little more of that in my slide presentation on cost. Up to that. So, um, so again, I've been here for less than three months. So I'm getting up to speed on lots, lots of things. And uh, hopefully I have some things here that uh, I have found out while I've been here and I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, and we'll, we have done a lot of projects in the last year. A lot of things have gone off the ground and have been completed. Uh, we have many more in design right now for next year. Uh, so a lot of the funds are, uh, while not spent, they are committed or thought to be committed over the next couple of years. All the projects in design next year will, this year will all go under uh, contract for building next summer. That's several million probably in projects coming next summer. Uh, but I want to kind of start off my presentation with, there you go, where to go? Uh, in talking about streets, engineering looks at what we call pavement condition index, PCI, and PCI tells us what level uh, how our streets are doing, and they're based on a visual uh, inspection of the streets. You can also do some testing of the streets, but a variety of items here you can see all lend to the PCI, and then based on that, it tells us where the streets rank in, uh, in need of – that mouse is not very, very responsive. <laughs> okay, so this is a general, uh, PCI rates from zero to 100. If you just put a street down, whether it's concrete or asphalt, and you pave it, it's at 100. And from there, it just goes downhill. And it deteriorates at a predictable rate based on traffic loading on it. Uh, hopefully it's well constructed to begin with. Most streets are designed to last 20 to 25 years. And with maintenance, you can get them to last longer than that. Uh, each one has, we look for a different PCI based on traffic flows or arterials or the main streets in the city expected to carry generally over 15, 18,000 vehicles per day. Uh, our arterials are King, Harrison, and uh, 224 is a regional uh, uh, arterial by, well, highway by ODOT maintains. Uh, collectors are the next level down. They're designed to carry traffic 
generally several thousand up to about 12, 15, 12,000 per day is kind of average for a collector. Uh, many of those, uh, Linwood's a collector, Stanley's a collector as, as examples. Um, Lake Road. Yeah. Lake Road is an arterial. That's the other arterial we have. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, and then everything else falls under the local street. And so with increased traffic, that's why the PCIs, what's acceptable varies with this with the street because a heavily used street deteriorates rap more rapidly than a lightly used street. So you're able to go with a lower PCI. And this is from uh, one of my engineers. This is a summary of the PCIs that we have on record currently. These are not up to date. Some of these date back to 2012, other ones are 2016. We currently have a contract out right now to rate some of the streets for their PCI. Uh, we're doing pretty good on arterial. With 70 Two percent are adequate to not needing any major maintenance for six to ten years, uh, and the reconstruct now is pretty low, twelve point three percent. A lot of that is lake, and lake is really on the budget for next summer. So once the lake's there, that reconstruct now number will drop quite quite low. Uh, collectors, we're not uh, we're doing okay on, not as well as the arterials. Again, with the reconstruction of Linwood, which will be next summer, and the reconstruction of 43rd, which is one of next summer's projects, um, those will both be, again, the reconstruct now will drop down and the adequate will, will rise quite a bit. Uh, the streets that give me most concern are the local residential. Uh, only 22% are adequate, 30% are in the reconstruct now, and they also have by far the greatest square footage of any street in the city, 6 million square feet. Um, and to give you an idea of the cost to maintain streets, uh, this is based on 2019 contracts, so the story still we talk about, the 6.1 miles that gives a new thin surface coat to the street, $222,000 for 946,000 square feet, so pretty good mm -hmm. amount of coverage for the money spent. The contract we're taking to council next Tuesday for, to reconstruct is for 0 0.6 miles of street, $944,500, and that's without a contingency. The contract you'll council will see is actually for like one point oh. Seven million because we added 15% contingency there in case other things come up that we are unexpected. But that's the that's the contract price provided to us by. Uh, and that's uh, just pavement. That's not any utility work. Or that's anything. not utility work. This is taking these streets are completely trash. Uh, they were not poorly constructed to begin with. Some of them do not have base rock. Some of them are, are an inch or two inches of asphalt right on dirt. Uh, we the standard street side is uh, for local or four inches of asphalt over 12 inches of rock. For arterials, it's more of six inches of asphalt over 12 inches of rock. So that 94,000 square feet of street, we're digging down uh, 18 to 20 inches, taking out whatever asphalt's there, whatever rock remains, any soil that's there, and we're re putting in all fresh rock, fresh asphalt, and rebuilding it. So extremely expensive. So if you go back to the previous slide and you think of, okay, we're spending a million dollars for roughly 100,000 square feet of street, and you look at this, and we have 30% of 6 million, we're at 1.8 million square footage of street that is failing at that price is Today's contract price is $18 million to rebuild that residential streets. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because, as it says under the third bullet there, currently the street fee rates do not include the maintenance or reconstruction of local streets. We street fees include uh, maintenance reconstruction of locals and collectors, I mean, arterials and collectors, and that's probably why those are at a fairly high percentage of looking good. Uh, the only other revenue we get for streets that are uh, not based on the city street fees is the gas tax reimbursement we get from the state and the brand new county uh, vehicle registration fee, which we have not received money yet, but we are, we will get 40% of their revenue combined. 
My gut estimate's about 900,000, and I base that from my previous city. I used to work in Wilsonville, and the population there that lives in Clackamas County is almost the same as this city, and so that's about what Wilsonville was gonna see, and I think that's about what we'll see. Uh, but as you see, $900,000 is not gonna go far towards an $18 million rebuild of local streets. So just wanna bring that to your attention. Uh, I'm not looking for a decision tonight. I just want it out there to think about what we are we gonna do with these local streets as we move into the, into the future. Obviously, the maintenance that uh, we're doing, the 946,000 square feet was excellent this summer. Uh, there's a lot of other streets that can benefit from a slurry seal, uh, but there's other streets that putting the slurry seal on it is like the old saying, putting lipstick on a pig is not gonna do anything, it's gonna fall apart anyways, so. So back to your chart, so the, um, can we go back to that? So the rehabilitate now are the streets that slurry seal would work on yes. and the reconstruct now, it wouldn't. It would not. Okay. Yeah. And uh, typically, even on a brand new street, the rule of thumb, you want to come in and slurry seal within seven to 10 years and that extends the lifespan of that street out. Uh, significantly, and so if you do a regular maintenance program, including slurry seal, including crack seal, and we have our own crack seal machine, right, mm -hmm. Peter? Yes, we do. And so if you do this, uh, the, the things that tear a street apart are water in the subgrade, so cracks in the street, uh, water to get in, the subgrade gets softer and softer, street cracking gets worse and worse and worse, so you really wanna seal a street from water penetration, and as long as you keep that street sealed from water, it will generally last quite a while. And that, that's the goal for both crack seal and slurry seal. And rehabilitate can also be the point where the street's not in great condition, so we'll go in and do a two inch grind and overlay. So you grind off the top two inches of asphalt, you reinstall two inches of asphalt, and that will rehab a street and make it last quite a while longer too. But once it gets to a certain state of just severe cracking, we call it uh, uh, alligator cracking, so it's the little tiny squares you see on a street. Once it gets to the point of being an alligator street, you pretty much have to go down and replace the rock, replace everything. It means the subgrade has failed, and you can asphalt over that, and it'll just alligator again within a short amount of time. Yes, Ann. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, does, so does the city have a crack sealing program, and how much does it accomplish every year? Well, we do. We, we, we did this last year. We did 960,000 square feet of crack seal for $222,000. So we, we do have a, cra uh, a in slurry which, seal. In which streets on this chart are, would be being addressed by that program? Uh, actually, there, all the streets that we did, uh, were some, there's some locals on there, right? Some yeah, locals? Yeah, they, they were up primarily, they were local streets. Yeah, they were, they were primarily locals. Uh, I know Stanley was slurry seal, that was the collector that was done, but most of them are local streets. Is Harvey done? But crack sealing is not slurry sealing, right? No, so we actually did crack, we actually did the crack sealing prior to doing the slurry sure. seal. So we did that in house, our, our, our public works uh, crews. So the city's only doing crack sealing in conjunction with slurry sealing? Or no, do, not necessarily. We do, we, we do it, we do both. Okay. So. Yeah. Councilor Beatty, Harvey is scheduled for 21. Oh, okay. I was trying to remember, there was a lot of streets over in sort of Ardenwald and Llewellyn that were the yeah. focus of the slurry ceiling this yeah. year. There's quite a bit of list. I, I received a spreadsheet from um, our uh, uh, water superintendent. Uh, Rennell. Rennell. What, I'm not sure what his uh, title is. Is water superintendent? Public Works Supervisor. Uh, public Works Supervisor, uh, Rennell Sears. Got a email from her today, that, and it was probably 15, 18 streets on there that were all slurry sealed this last summer. So again, I don't have a solution for this. I'm just pointing out that I noticed this is a kind of, I see a shortfall in funding and maintenance. I just wanted, I'll have to dig in this more. Is this a common problem for cities our size or just because Milwaukee's got so many old streets that are? This is a problem with old streets. Right. I, I came from Wilsonville and we didn't have numbers nearly this bad. Very Wilsonville had there. much, right much here. newer. Yeah, Wilsonville right. was square at 69. Uh, half the streets were built while I was there. The city went from 14,000 to 25,000 people right. in the last 17 years. So yeah, much newer streets. This is a problem of, of, of older streets. And in previous years, not spending the money to maintain them as they needed to be maintained. So that's, I don't know what the maintenance program was for the last 20, 30 years, but if you're not doing anything to a street, it's just gonna continue. 
oh. to decline on you. If, if I could add, so uh, John, when I living in Illinois, when I was in Illinois, uh, I was the assistant public works director for a community of about 13,000, and and we, we had the same issue with uh, providing, a, finding a funding source to, to take care of our, our local streets. Uh, yeah, we didn't well, have an SSMP fund. The weather's much harsher back there. It, it is much harsher. But if, if I, let me just add one thing that Steve mentioned about the water, you know, water damaging the pavement. You know, one of the other things that we have on or we don't have on many of our local neighborhood streets are curb and gutter. So the pavement starts to get eaten at those edges uh, mm -hmm. as people try to park and, and, and it's just causes damage and erodes and... Well, some of the streets coming in Ardenwall that come down off of 32nd where the hill, I, you put those gutters in, it makes a huge difference. Sure. Oh, the little hump, she mean? Right, the little, right. Yeah. Channel the water a little bit. Right, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, Kathy has yes. a question. Okay. I don't want to Sorry. take us too far down the road of understanding roads and not talking about budget, but um, do we have a sense of some sort of inventory of which of our local residential streets uh, have a poor bed beneath them? Okay. We have pretty good. We, I have a pretty extensive spreadsheet. It's many pages long that I could email and share with the budget committee if they want. It talks about the condition of the arterials, the collectors, and the locals. Uh, it's very in-depth, and uh, it, I have it color-coded to match what you see here, the reconstruct rehab, but it does show uh, what locals are in the worst shape. Okay, and I guess what I was trying to get at with that is, do we have a way of anticipating how fast our remaining streets are going to move from adequate 610, 1 to 5 to rehab and reconstruct. Um, or, or is it? It's bad, and how, how much worse is it going to get? It, right. It, how and fast how fast? Is it get well, worse? <laughs> what, yeah. what generally, um, if you do nothing on the streets that are reconstruct now, they'll just basically turn back into gravel eventually because they'll get so badly alligator you basically have a gravel street uh, and actually some cities in the u.s have that's one of the course of actions they've accepted that certain streets with low traffic will just go back to gravel uh, uh, some again there's a lot, lot of money here to bring these up to grade how do we do it uh, I need to look into this further, but obviously without funding 18 million to bring this 30 percent back up to a uh, PCI of 100, it's going to be commitment from something. I don't know where the money's going to come from. I think it would be really valuable to have the spreadsheet. I'm, I'm curious about um, not just, you know, what the, whether the, whether the, whether it's identified that streets are through streets. I think we have mm -hmm. a lot of streets where we might be making, you know, where we might have co policy conversations about whether or not to, not necessarily let them go to gravel, but there might be some other um, prioritization. And alternative, yep. and alternative street designs. We've talked a lot about Woonerfs and other alternative designs that might accomplish something. Yeah, so I just started digging into this, so this again will be a lot more inf uh, effort as I've uh, been tasked to do the CIP budget for the next two years. This will be looking at that and a lot of other things. The other thing I want to bring to... So are, are you going to send out the spreadsheet? That's what I want Yes, to yes. Uh, okay. They're quite lengthy, so I will send them each out. Uh, well, it's all one spreadsheet. There's three tabs, one for arterials, one for collectors, one for locals. But the local is probably six to eight pages of local street information. Arterials is really easy. It's less than a page, and our collectors are like a page and a half. But locals, very lengthy. Mm -hmm. 15 megabyte file? No, it's, not, it's just a spreadsheet, so it's, it doesn't take much... Okay. Much, uh, much space now. I did talk to the guy that was surveying my street when he was out there doing it, which is not in good shape. It's in the 30%. All right. So the along, with, along with street maintenance and reconstruct, I wanted to also bring uh, to your attention the stormwater facilities with street uh, reconstruction. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with this. We, we do have the NPDES is National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. It's uh, federally uh, mandated and is to uh, create cleaner stormwater running off streets and buildings and stuff at the end of the natural uh, environment. MS4 permits issued through Oregon DEQ, it's a general permit, and we are in tandem with many other jurisdictions in Clackamas County. So I know it's Wilsonville, uh, Oregon City, Clackamas County itself, and the several other cities are all part of the same uh, MS4 
permit and we've committed to uh, doing certain type of stormwater facilities, uh, we have to have a plan in place by February of 2023 on how we're handling things. But right now you're, we're supposed to be uh, treating stormwater runoff near the, the point source as much as possible and using green infrastructure uh, as much as possible. Uh, these are just two little blurbs out of that MS4 permit, which is several pages long, uh, but it basically tells that we what we were required to do to meet our permit, and the low impact development requirements, uh, engineers refer to that as LIDA facilities, you hear the term LIDA, it's the green infrastructure that l sits alongside of a street where the stormwater runs off, enters, soaks in, there's several plants in it that will absorb the water or evaporate. Uh, uh, transpiration and uh, and it, special soil in it that pulls the heavy metals and pollutants out of the uh, rainwater and the rainwater is supposed to drain through it. It'll either infiltrate into the ground or you can have a perf pipe in the bottom and it goes out to your storm system, out to a, a river. But by by our uh, MS4 permit, we're supposed to be putting in low impact development uh, uh, facilities on the, uh, Development and redevelopment, and many engineers choose to look at redevelopment as a grind and overlay. So if you're doing just a slurry seal, that's just a maintenance program, and so you, you, we generally don't do stormwater facilities with that, but once you do a street rebuild or a grind and overlay, that's many jurisdictions look at that as we should be doing a stormwater facility with that. Uh, this is the cost to construct. These are actually based on 2018 contracts. This is both the Selwood safe contract and the uh, Ardenwald contract. Selwood, the, con the initial bid came in so high that the project manager refused all bids, redesigned it, took out all of the stormwater lighter facilities that were supposed to go in. So the numbers for that contract, which were what was originally received as a bid, but we never built stormwater with Selwood because of the cost. Um, and while we'll address this in a minute, you mentioned we have a five million surplus in right. stormwater, uh, but right now that is not budgeted to the light of facilities on these streets. So as we go into design right now with Linwood and 43rd Avenue, uh, uh, 22nd and River and the other uh, safe projects, we don't have sufficient funds to pay for the light of facilities in those. So I need to work with uh, Peter and work with staff, work with uh, budget about where can we get this money because by law, to meet our MS4 permitting, we need to be putting this in when the street gets, gets reconstructed or street gets a, a grind and overlay. So the... The um, estimates that we built the safe fee around did not include this. Did not, Sam. No, the, the safe fees looked at uh, some minor things on water, like moving a fire hydrant back to make room for a, 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 a um, sidewalk, or some minor storm repairs, sanitary sewer repairs, but it did not look at the Building cost the of installing the swales, the rain gardens, all of that. It's all it's all missing. So uh, we're left kind of scrambling for money. I know we, we missed this, the uh, the Selwood one. Uh, we did get some stormwater facilities in on the Ardenwald one. Uh, so are we obligated to do this? Yes. Or is it just something we need? No, we're obligated, we're obligated. By February of 2023, we need to have a program in place. Are we, uh, and we need to answer if we did put a rebuilt street in or a brand new street in, if we didn't do this, eventually we need to answer to state DEQ about why we didn't. So the reason we're talking about this tonight is because um, that is one of the places where there was some question about whether or not we were gonna fully expend. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, we have some large projects that are taking up all that money that we're looking at right now. Those projects, we're still trying to figure out how to get out the door. Uh, and it does not allow for us to do the things we need to do for this permit. So I just wanna make sure that everybody's really understanding that even though we're collecting a lot of money into storm right now, it is not sufficient for the installations that we require for our, for our system. 
Yeah, mo most of the $5 million in the storm, that's kind of what the uh, ending reserves are over above budget. Right, right. Those are pulled out and on hold for the Meek Street storm extension project, which is we needed for both the Murphy development and the Monroe uh, apartments or the McFarland site. And so that money's kind of tied up with that project right now. It's unavailable to others. And so at the same time, it's, it's odd having a $5 million pot of money somewhere and then not having enough money to build your stormwater facilities uh, per your state permit on all these other street projects. So is something to bring to your attention. Uh, somehow in the, going in the future, we're gonna need to address it. Uh, and I'm not sure where the money will come from, but I, when Jen Garber gets back from vacation and Kelly gets back from vacation, we'll, we'll get more in depth in discussing this. And as I look into you know, the next uh, biennium CIP projects, we need to identify funding for uh, the stormwater so we're meeting our state, state permit requirements. You so are designing it for next summer's projects? Yes, yeah. and we're designing them with storm and then we're gonna figure out how to, how to pay for it between now and then. The, the other part that I would mention with all these additional facilities that we uh, construct, there's a requirement to maintain them as well. So, you know, I've got two, two people, people and a seasonal employee that that work to maintain them and, and they have a hard time keeping up. Uh, so. Yeah, and that's a I problem with other cities. that I come from Public Works, so I get worried about the maintenance part. Um, this is happening on a couple of projects, not just on Storm, but in other places where it looks like we're underexpending, and that's why I asked Steve to share this tonight. It looks like we're underexpending, but really what's happening is we have a singular project in each fund or in different funds that require us to hold on to some cash while we try and get through permitting processes, work with ODOT, work with the railroads, whatever that may be. Uh, and so it, it's misleading that those funds are somehow available for other projects. We still have needs in other places that we're not able to fulfill even though it looks like we're underexpending. And it's not that we don't have staff designing that work or on that work or focusing on that work. We simply, we hit a roadblock and it goes on hold for a while and it looks like the cash is unexpended. So Bonnie, is there anything like a committed reserve line we could have to say this $5 million, really there's only about a million there that you can actually use because you got four million collected in some for some future project. Can you put that on your financial statement some, somehow? Yeah, I don't, um, I'd have to look into that. I don't right. think that that's something that I've seen typically, um, a committed reserve line. Um, but that is largely our CIP. Yeah. That's part of why I'm bringing it up tonight, is that our CIP, we've got an incredible, incredible group of people who are working on it, and I feel very lucky for the two who are sitting at this table tonight. Um, but it is, um, they're going to deliver, they've made commitments to delivering, but some of these projects are harder than others, and some of them have hit some walls that we're trying to get through, while simultaneously we don't have sufficient revenue to pay for some other things that are critical. So we didn't want, people to get a sense by looking at a 63% number that there were funds that were unexpected. Those funds are simply caught at the moment with the plan to have them out the door by the end of the biennium. Could you explain what a CIP is? Yeah, uh, actually it's our, con our capital, improvement, capital plan. improvement plan, thank you. Yeah. Um, so it's basically everything we're building. So whether that's for buildings, for streets, for facilities, and uh, wells, uh, water infrastructure, all the things that we own, the hardscape of what we own. Yeah. If I could add one thing uh, to your question on Bonnie. So when we did our, our rate studies, our water and wastewater rate right, studies, right. Uh, the consultant uh, came back with some recommendations for uh, the minimum cash balances and went through uh, some some calculations for that. I actually have a slide that I can I can go over and, and talk a little bit about. Yeah, okay. Okay. If no other questions, I'll let Peter handle sanitary and water. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Uh, so as, as Ann had earlier mentioned, uh, we've got a, 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 a well, a pretty good sized product, or well number two project, uh, out at 40th and Harvey. Uh, 
it's, it's a project that we started. I, I think it was started when I first got here about two years ago. They started going through the solicitation to hire a consultant uh, to begin the design of the project. Uh, so we went through the design phase of the project and went out for bids uh, in December of 2018, uh, awarded it to Holt Services, a uh, local well drilling company out of, out of Washington. Uh, the project's broken down into two phases. There's a well construction phase that's currently going on right now. And then there's uh, the second phase, which is the well house uh, and mechanical and piping phase of the project. So our well number two, we're replacing that well because the casing in that original well was was cracked and broken, and we weren't getting uh, we weren't getting the, the capacity that we should get out of the well. Uh, our first phase of that contract, uh, which, which I believe uh, we awarded to Holt uh, in the early part of March. Uh, was six hundred and roughly six hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. We've had three change orders to that that uh, actually reduced the the contract price to about six hundred and thirteen thousand. The first change order uh, dealt with the exploratory borehole that we drilled. Uh, we decided to drill down a little bit deeper uh, because the the. Uh, the, ge the, the geology there allowed us to do that, and we wanted to, to, to see what was down there and uh, get a better understanding of where the water bearing formations were. Uh, the second change order from based off of the exploratory borehole, we decided we could get more water and, and uh, from, from some lower depths, we changed that the casing design and uh, made some minor changes there. And then the third change order, the really the deductive change order, deals with the decommissioning of our well number one, which is an old well that the city had not uh, properly abandoned and decommissioned when it went out of service several years ago. We were able to work with uh, OHA and uh, DEQ to come up with an alternative way to decommission it that saved us some money. Um, so the first phase is, is should be completed uh, the early part of September. Uh, we're expecting the second phase to start up uh, going out for bids in early September as well, uh, with the expected completion of that being probably, I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that it's gonna be early winter, but it may be the late late part of winter, early, early spring. Uh, the estimated cost of that second phase is about a half a million dollars, and uh, the total project cost is about 1.14 million. Can I ask you the, um the having the well deeper is the is there any difference in water quality and pools down in the aquifer or is it all pretty much the same it's it's water? actually it, it's actually different yeah it is a little bit different uh, and I actually I have another slide here to talk a little bit more about could I, I yes um, could you go back to the other slide? So if the current contract is for $613,000, $614,000, and the total project is for $1.14 billion, what, um, will there be a second contract with the same? Uh, it'll, it'll be a different company? Uh, It'll be a different contractor, so we're going to go out for uh, solicit bids in September for that second phase of the project, the actual well house construction and mechanical and piping part of that. Uh, okay, so the, the first contract is basically the people that are drilling the hole and the other ones are going to build all the rest of the connecting stuff. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. A little bit more in detail on, on, on the project. So we, we finished that exploratory drilling of the well uh, at the end of May, uh, and we found we found some pretty inf pretty interesting information. So the original well two is about 25 yards away from uh, the new well. We thought the geology was going to be pretty consistent to what the well bore log showed. Uh, it wasn't, and we think maybe the well bore log wasn't 
necessarily correct. Uh, the original well is about 280 feet. We got down to about 392 feet. And what we found uh, during that is the sort of water bearing uh, stratas in, in, the, in, the, in the geology there were at different layers than what it was at the other well. 25 feet away. 25 feet away, yeah. Uh -huh. 25 feet or 25 yards? 25 yards, 75, 75, yeah. Still, that's for the uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so right now they're in the uh, process of uh, finishing the well development. So they're doing, they've, they've put in a temporary pump uh, to do pump testing to see what the capacity of the well is going to be. We thought that we were going to get uh, a well capacity of approximately, I think it was about 4.4 gallons per minute per foot of drawdown. So when you start pumping the water, there's a cone that draws down. Uh, that's what we originally designed it for, but what we found in this well, uh, we're getting closer to eight gallons per minute per foot, which is, which is good. Uh, so we've been spending the time uh, developing that well and doing the sort of rampant testing it at different levels of pumping, and then we're going to do sort of like a fixed rate of pumping. And then once they're done with that, uh, we'll have a better, uh, a real good clean idea of what the final pump design needs to be. And then we'll adjust that final pump design for our, our second phase of the, the contract and go out for bids with that. Uh, so they'll be done uh, really by the end of this end of this month, early September, with uh, that that phase of the of the project, uh, the wellhouse construction. So we've got the final pump design. We'll bid in September, and as I said, winter 2020, we'll have that uh, wrapped up and put together. Uh, we do have a sort of a, a third sort of phase to that uh, that we have to do is the a final abandonment of the existing well number two. That was originally part of the uh, first phase of the project, but we found uh, that we the price was was pretty high for that. Um, so we thought maybe we would we could, we would we could rebid that out and and perhaps get a better price the, a, a third time around or a second time around on that. And then, as I mentioned, there's that other well number one uh, decommissioning that they're going to start uh, late August, early September, and finish up. Yeah. So what's the difference between abandonment and decommissioning in terms of your process? I, I just use nothing. They're I just the use, same. They're the same. I, I, I apologize for that. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> uh, and then I, it's hard to make out, and I can send the slides to everybody, but the... Uh, uh, there's on, on the illustration on the on the far right there is is the shows where the screens are in the well casing as you go down in the well. So, any any questions on this? So this is a project that we you know we've been holding on to some cash to to get it to get it constructed. Um, and then we have another big project that we've been working on as well that's uh, actually turned out to be uh, a little bit more expensive than we originally had budgeted in our um, CIP two years ago, or I guess it was, yeah, a year and a half ago. Uh, and that's our Stanley Reservoir, our three million, three million gallon reservoir. Uh, hasn't been painted in a long time. There's actually big f flakes of paint peeling off the exterior of that of that uh, reservoir. Uh, we've uh, we've had it inspected, and we found some some additional deficiencies that we hadn't realized before we had gone to out out for out for design. Uh, Specifically, there's some items, size, some seismic deficiencies that we've identified that are further being uh, analyzed by a uh, structural engineer right now. Uh, so there's an interior ring on the inside of that tank that all of the I-beams go to that uh, uh, hold, the, hold the tank up and out. Uh, they, there's some concern about the size of the I-beams and where the uh, 
the ring is located inside the tank uh, that affect the, its seismic resiliency. So we're, we're looking at that and analyzing that. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see what the, the, the consultant recommends in terms of how to reinforce that, that piece. Uh, but the, the current project budget was originally about $1.5 million. It's going to be actually closer to about $2.6 million. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, since we haven't painted it in a long time, that exterior of that tank actually has lead-based paint on it. Uh, so when you go to remove that and blast that tank, you have to have it fully contained, and there's a lot of protection that the workers have to have, and that it's all the paint and dust have to be collected, and that, that adds a quite a premium to that project. And uh, are, is it painting the interior as well? We, it, we are going to paint the interior as well. We're going to do that's a, what they did at the big we're tank. Gonna, yeah, uh, a yeah. full rehab on oh, this. No. Uh, Does the interior have lead based paint? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not that we've not that we found when we did the sampling, but there's probably some areas where where it, there's some small areas that it might it might be, uh, but nothing nothing of significance. Uh, but the exterior is is. is uh, Serious. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's got some lead paint on it. Uh, there's also, I, I said there's some seismic issues, and then there's some minor structural components. We need to make some repairs to the ladder and the hatches uh, because those have, there's changes in OSHA requirements and, and the way you, the ladders are connected. Uh, and then there's some piping issues and mixing issues in the tank as well that we need to need to correct. So we are anticipating going out for bid on this project in the late fall, early winter, uh, once we get the design wrapped up. Uh, painting contractors are hard to schedule. They usually, usually takes, you usually need to get like six to nine months out to get them scheduled. Uh, and also we want to schedule it where during a time where we're not using a lot of water. So we're looking at actually doing this project uh, next fall, fall of 2020, having having a, a contractor in place though uh, this winter, uh, and start start the construction uh, in the fall of 2020. Uh, so to do this, we actually are going to reallocate some funds that we've got for some CIP in next year's budget, our well number eight project, that is uh, a well that we haven't used for several years uh, because of some iron fouling. So we're actually looking for another site to, uh, to, to drill another well. So we're going to reallocate some of those dollars, or those dollars, uh, to pay for the for the reservoir, and then we have some other minor uh, well upgrades and and building upgrades that we're going to use those dollars for if 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 needed for for contingency. Uh, one of the things that I've I've found, and I've I know I've talked to Ann and and Steve about this, is uh, we've spent a lot of dollars on our distribution system, but we really haven't spent a lot of money over the last several years or 10 years on a lot of our treatment and storage facilities. I know we did our uh, tower at Water Tower Park, but that was the first uh, sort of first big project that they'd done on the treatment and uh, storage components of our infrastructure and our wells. Uh, we do have another project that we're working on that that's goes that sort of crosses both the water and the wastewater boundaries, and that's our, our, our SCADA system, which is a uh, it's an automated computer it's it's a computer system that we use to uh, manage our treatment and pumping of of, of water, uh, as well as our pump stations. So it allows the operator, our, our team, to operate the system remotely from, from their desk. Uh, we have a, a really unique system that was installed back in the mid, mid to late 90s, and there really hasn't been any significant upgrades to, the, to that. Uh, a lot of the uh, components of the system are are aged and you, you, you can only buy some of them uh, 
off of eBay from, from time to time. <laughs> uh, so it's, it, it, Say the black market. <laughs> the, not, not the black market, but uh, so it's, it's a little concerning. So one of the things that uh, I had noticed when I, when I got here was we had this, uh, we had this issue, uh, so we spent the last year uh, working with a consultant to develop a, a SCADA master plan. So that's sort of the plan to upgrade our system. So we have to upgrade this system while we continue to maintain our current SCADA system. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a there's an IT component to this, a communic telecommunications component to this, and then there's the uh, programmable logic controllers, the PLCs, that actually operate the pumps, tell the, communicate back with the system uh, to tell things when to turn off and on and when to, when to add chlorine and not add chlorine. So we've got to change all those components out while we're still operating the current system. Uh, so we just wrapped up that plan. They identified and made some recommendations on how we go about doing that. So we're gonna, the next step is to go out and work on the detailed system design for this uh, SCADA system. And this is a project that we actually have in our CIP, uh, yeah, both in our uh, wastewater and water side. Uh, so we're gonna start that detailed de system design of that, of that project. So we're gonna go out for, uh, advertise an RFQ in September. Uh, we're looking at the budget range of being about 750 to 120 or 1.2 million dollars. Uh, so this is gonna be a, a project that's gonna be uh, phased in over over a period of time as we, as, we, as we go through this. So anytime you start talking about automating, I wonder uh, about energy efficiency improvements and how this, speaks to our climate change plan um, and whether or not there's any merit in talking to PGE about it. I have actually had conversations with, with PGE um, about ways to, to save uh, on, on pumping cost. You know, they, they certainly have uh, time of use rates right. that they, they really thinking. look for, you know, they, they like uh, storage. So if you can pump and store water somewhere uh, and pump that water, not during the hot times or right, the, or, like or, at 2 a. or two, right. <laughs> that, that, that's really beneficial and you yeah. can take advantage of those, those sorts of rates. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have our, our, our system, our new SCADA system in place, uh, I think that will, will, will really help us take advantage of, of some of those components. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we, we certainly have had, had those conversations with those and are, and are looking at that. Great. And does the SCADA system just measure sort of quality and flow or does it is it also like going to tell you when there's been damage because there's an earthquake or something like uh, that so it th it does provide alarms so you know a anything from hey this pump's not pumping there's a community or we're not communicating uh there's uh high high water alarm low water alarm so you know if there's an earthquake you probably get that low water alarm if a pipe breaks so, you know or you have a, a massive uh, water main break somewhere in the system that's telling you that there's there's a problem that you know you're the 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 level in one of the tanks is dropping, so you get those alarms. And we have people that are on call that that routinely take those calls. One of the issues that we're having is we have a lot of just general communication failures, just because the radio systems that we use to communicate from the different remote sites aren't working as well as they did when they were originally installed. So we've worked with our IT department uh, and, and the consultant to identify some different ways to, to improve those communications, to include some hardwired fiber for some of the sites and, and also uh, to radios and, and a cellular sort of backup. As and well. so when the police bought new radios, I remember you, you guys were buying radios on the same frequency or whatever, their, that new system. So this will also tie into that? No, it's a no. Di completely, different completely different frequency, yeah. Okay. Completely different, yeah. And I had a question.
question that actually goes back to the the wells. Uh, you don't need to change the, the slide or anything, but if pump number two is does indeed prove out to be a lot more productive than you had initially expected, uh, is there a point at which you revisit the question of whether or not we need as many wells as we have in our plan? Or, I mean, I know that capacity to serve the system is constrained by the pipes. So oh. maybe that's not. Yeah, it won't be a sufficient. It won't be a sufficient improvement to replace an entire well, mm -hmm. um, and we certainly don't want to get rid of any of the water rights that we do have. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it it does provide us additional, you know, flexibility. flexibility. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So the shelf life of these SCADA systems is about twenty years. Uh, well, that I about <laughs> ten. Well. <laughs> so. It, it, in my, in, when I was back in Illinois, we actually would do periodic upgrades about every five to six years on, on the system. So that was uh, software, some of the computer hardware, and then also some of the PLCs. So we didn't have a big major project. So we had, uh, we had a SCADA system at our wastewater plant, water treatment plant, also for our, our electric utility. Uh, so that's like minor maintenance and upgrades as opposed to a full blow. This is like Steve's street reconstruction versus doing. Okay. Right. right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean that that sort of is part of the story on why there's some there's cash as well in in the on the water side that that we need to spend. One of the things that has come out of both of these conversations, though, and I know that it's something that Chair and I have spoken to, yeah, and that we've spoken about, is uh, the taking of debt around these issues. So when we talk about the Meek Street project, we came to you at the last meeting or two meetings ago to talk about taking out debt from the state. Uh, we did receive that loan. So we are in the process of finishing that paperwork up with the state. Uh, but there's also a second piece to this, which is in order to do some of these storm improvements that are tied to the street projects, we may be coming back to you and asking for additional debt in order to take debt now um, around getting those infrastructures tied to the safe projects as we proceed. So we'll know more by the next time we come before council uh, and before the budget committee, but we just wanted to highlight that that may be something that shows up in our next discussion. I, I, th I mean, I think we'd also, I mean, I, I, I won't speak out of turn, but I, I, I saw Councillor Beatty's eyes go up and mine did too. Um, I think we need a little bit more of an education on, on exactly what those requirements are, you Absolutely. know, as they're tied to streets or, you know, some of these other projects that are in safe that aren't really street reconstructions or bike lane. You know, there's 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 a lot of projects, a wide range of them, um, that we're that we're kind of collectively calling the safe program. Um, and I'd like to have a way better understanding about what those requirements are and kind of what triggers, yeah. you know, a, a huge build out of something so expensive. So have we had a discussion about MS4 permits in the <coughs> past, Council? I'm looking at Lisa. Since I've been on council. No, no, I don't think so. No. So we'll um, schedule some time. No. no, no, that's great. So we'll schedule some time on an MS4 permit. Uh, that's the first piece. And then the second piece will be the tie to the infrastructure improvement projects. Um, and that's really Steve figuring out which projects we need to have, which projects will be going forward, whether they're safe or something else over the course of the next five years, and which ones are gonna require us to put in the installation. I guess, I mean, my eyes went up because I assumed that we were building swales with all these projects. No. I assumed that was part of the estimate. I mean, because I built a sidewalk, you know, six, five, six years ago, and I had to build a swale, so I assumed everywhere we're building sidewalks, we're building swales. But they're so. not all sidewalks, so I mean, that's- No, no, I, not that, everything. So like, so, to, yeah. to, to, I mean, my my takeaway from what the comment was, I don't think is accurate, and so I want to make sure that we have a much clearer picture, mm -hmm. because not everything in the safe program would would require such a mm -hmm. such a large investment. Um, we will come back to you rather than trying to one off answer it. But I also want to go back to the staff reports that we did during uh, the bonding discussion that we did a year and a half ago, because I do believe we talked about this to an extent in that staff report. Just my vague recollection. So we'd like to make sure that we bring that part of the conversation mm -hmm. back. Thank you. Yep. I, I 
I did want to follow up and, and talk a little bit about the water and the wastewater studies that we had done this past year. So, uh, you know, we worked with uh, Utility Financial Services, a, a consultant that does uh, the, the, the broad spectrum of, of utility rate studies uh, from electric to, to fiber to water and wastewater and stormwater. And we folk, we did a water and wastewater one and actually asked them to look at our rates for the next two years. So, you know, we went through the process Process. I know uh, Dan Kasbaum from UFS came and, and gave a presentation to, uh, to the council, I think in early April, and then we followed up with, uh, there were some questions, we followed up with some uh, responses and some additional information or, or some additional uh, a change in the rate structure, rate design in May. Uh, so I did, during that process early on, uh, one of the first things that Dan looked at when he was doing uh, the analysis of the rates was, does the does the utility need to take out debt based off of its current financial situation? Uh, and he, uh, he went through that analysis and determined that wasn't necessary because we were generating sufficient revenue for the CIP and our operations and maintenance expenses that we had identified. Uh, so, uh, so we, we at, that, at that point, we sort of put that, that piece to the side and looked at our, our rate structure. And, you know, the analysis from that was on the water that we, we didn't need to do uh, a rate increase on the water. Uh, so, you know, we could leave it at a 0% increase for uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, and, uh, but make some revenue neutral adjustments to the rate structure. So uh, we found that there was some subsidization on some of the customer classes. Uh, so we, we made some changes to the, the commercial customer fixed chart, fixed rates. And then we also made an adjustment to the uh, residential rate that provided uh, a discount to low water users. So if you used, uh, I, I, I think it was three units or less a month, you got a discount on your fixed customer charge. If you use more than that, the customer charge went back to, to what it was. On, on the wastewater side, uh, we found that we needed to do about a 2.5% increase over the, over the next two years. And we developed the rate structure uh, to do that and actually made some adjustments as well to the, the commercial and the larger customers uh, to increase their fixed customer charge. So one of the things that we found uh, during that time was that you know we were in this range of getting about 80% of our 85% of our revenue from uh, the consumption component and about 15 to 20% from from the fixed customer charge and there was some desire from some from some on council to to go to a full 100% uh, rate structure or at least look at it. We we evaluated that for the for the water, and uh, noted that there's certainly some some additional risk in doing that. That you add a lot of variability in terms of what sort of revenue that you uh, are gonna are gonna get uh, from your customers based on on their water use. Uh, one of the things I think you even see in our in the water fund here is on the fees and charges. I think uh, Bonnie's noted that you know we're sort of under budget on some of the fees there, and that's really sort of uh, I think generally on that on that consumption side. So you know people, you know there's uh, fixtures at homes are more water efficient, and people there's sort of been a trend since really 2008 2009. Uh, you know in 2008 water was going up. And then since then, it's sort of the the use and consumption has been going down across across the industry for for a lot of places, and we still sort of see that. So, well, we also had a mild summer, cooler, and we had more sort of midsummer rain than normal. So, is that a, no? This is factor in here. No, not, not yet. No, no. That, that's as of June thirtieth. So, so not. So this sort of captured the hotter the hotter summer last year. Yeah. The other thing. Uh, 
that, that I think part of the issue there is why we're sort of seeing that uh, that deficit on the fees and charges. So when we applied the rate increase last year, it was applied to overall to like the dollar amount. So you know we're going to have a 12 percent increase. We need to we or what was it like? We need to increase our rates by 11.85 percent, I think, on water. So. That was just sort of captured in the revenue, and there wasn't really a hard look at what the consumption data was showing and where you really needed to make changes to, to capture some of those uh, adjustments to see where uh, which customers were uh, uh, that were being subsidized and, and which ones weren't really u utilizing water. So when we did the the rates uh, this time around, we you know we we really took a hard look at at the consumption data over the last uh, five years, and then Dan projected out what he thought the 2000 he used the 2017 as his test year and made projections for 2018 or, or this end year, and then. Uh, made projections for, for this upcoming budget. So um, so this is based off of the rate structure that was approved uh, when we did the budget in 2018, right? Yeah. Peter, if I might add something, I know some from Wilsonville, the fees and charges being less than budgeted was a phenomenon they were seeing there for the last several years, and uh, a lot of that's tied to the more water efficient systems in uh, people either do a house remodel and they take out a whatever, you know, gallon per flush toilet and they put in something that's minimal. And the same thing with uh, uh, dishwashers or other items, there, there's a lot of energy efficiency plants out there now, and plus a growing number of people just are not watering their lawns in the summer, it's not even turn brown. So it's something that uh, we faced there is that we're trying to do budgets and stuff and the even though the population of the city was increasing the water usage was decreasing because of these these items that they had uh, um, seen go on ar around the city as even though we don't have as much new housing going in here I think with the remodels and stuff you're, you're, you're still seeing uh, a trend in that direction I, I would suspect thanks yeah. uh, and then I, one of the things I have up, up here is the, one of the uh, financial targets that the consultant looked at, and this is really the, the minimum cash reserve. We also looked at a couple other targets. One was, uh, you know, if we had debt. So on the, on the wastewater side, we looked at what the debt coverage ratio was. And then we also looked at a, a target operating income. Uh, so uh, when we went through the analysis on the cash, the cash balance piece, uh, the consultant actually looked at a couple different items here. So he looked at what are what were O and M costs and how much how much fund reserve should we hold back in place for to cover some of the O and M or operations and maintenance costs. He looked also at the historical fixed asset cost of 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 our utility uh, and then allocated a percentage to hold back for some sort of catastrophic event. And usually there's a range that he's used before. It's like between one to 3%, depending on how much your assets is depreciated out. So we were roughly about 40, I think it's, I think it says 49% depreciated on our assets. So he felt that that 1% was a good number, a good percentage to use for that historical cost basis uh, for catastrophic risk. The, the other piece was looking at if you had any debt, you wanna make sure you have 100% of your debt uh, covered in your, in your cash reserve uh, for that year. And then 20% of your working capital that's net of any bond proceeds. So we've got a big CIP over the next five years. So, you know, the number there, I think we've got 8 million, I think it's eight, almost eight and a half million dollars of CIP projects. So 20% of that's, you know, 1.6, 1.7 million dollars that are allocated towards the cash balance there. So his analysis there indicates that we should actually have had a little bit higher of a cash balance than we currently have under our current mm -hmm. structure. I think that, what is it, 50 50%? Mm -hmm. So he had indicated 
that we should have that. So if you if you if you looked at it, perhaps we had a bond, and we were bonding that eight and a half million dollars. You know, that's at like four and a half percent. That's six hundred and fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars in terms of a debt service payment. So you would add that. You'd need to have that cash, but you'd subtract out. Uh, some of that, that, that fixed at that 1.6 million, uh, that, and that changes that fixed, that cash balance, but it also changes some of the other financial targets because you want to make sure that you're getting uh, the appropriate rate of return for your, some of your operating income based off of the, the debt that you have. So as well. the bottom line number here is 2.3 million. Is that, is that what we're looking at? Minimum cash reserve levels? Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. for the water fund. For the water. Peter? I, I have a question. I, I'm confused. So, are you are you saying anything about what the what would happen to the minimum cash reserve recommended if any of that were bonded rather than being paid? It, it, would it make it go down? It, it potentially could make the minimum cash balance go, go down. down. But yeah. that's just one of your financial targets that you look at when you're right. setting your Right, but price. I just want to be clear, because I wasn't clear that that, that in fact, w would be a function of bonding, would reduce the minimum cash balance that you needed, because you would only have to have enough to cover the annual bond payment, right? You. You would, I right. mean, for you, that particular piece of the thing. Yes. I'm not talking about any other target. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Do you have something similar for wastewater and storm? Or? Uh, I do, but I don't have it on this slide. Okay. I'm sorry, but I can send it to you. I would appreciate <laughs> it's, that. Uh, yeah, it is part of the, I think it was part of the presentation that we did as yeah. well. Uh, but I can send that out to everybody. Any, any other questions or? It's been very informative. I really appreciate it. Uh, if there's not any other questions um, in the interest of time, um, we're going to try to wrap it up. Um, so uh, if you do have any questions on the report um, or if you want to continue on with the uh, water, wastewater, storm, water discussions. Um, uh, I just like to say I really appreciate the cash from operations being broken out here. Uh, it's very helpful. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I would agree we've kind of gone over these. <laughs> I'm in a lot to of detail. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Well, do we have any other items? <laughs> Get ahead of yourself. No right. other, other items. No other items. No, no other items. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Second. I'll second. Move and second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. yeah.